हेलो एवरीबॉडी दिस इज डॉक्टर विशाल त्रिवेदी फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायो साइंसेज एंड बायो इंजीनियरिंग आई आई टी गुवाहाटी एंड वॉट वी वर डिस्कसिंग वी वर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द इलेक्ट्रोफॉरसिस सो इन द प्रीवियस मॉड्यूल वी हैव डिस्कस अबाउट द डिफरेंट आस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ द वर्टिकल इलेक्ट्रोफॉरसिस द हॉरिजोंटल इलेक्ट्रोफॉरसिस एंड देन वी हैव इन द प्रीवियस लेक्चर वी हैव ऑल्सो डिस्कस अबाउट द डिफरेंट कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ द वर्टिकल एज वेल एज द हॉरिजोंटल इलेक्ट्रोफॉरसिस सो दैट यू कैन बी एबल टू अंडरस्टैंड एंड टैकल द डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ problems related to the uh, uh, understanding a particular process and we have also shown you how you can be able to utilize the different uh, vertical or the horizontal electrophoresis gels to answer the different types of questions now in the today's lecture we are also going to discuss about the scientific problems what you are going to uh, handle when you are going to uh, how to how to solve them and how to resolve the different types of problems and how you can be able to utilize the different types of electrophoresis apparatus so when we talk about the electrophoresis one thing is sure that the in the case of gel electrophoresis it actually utilizes the two different major techniques or major properties of a molecule which means the electrophoresis is either going to exploit the charge by mass ratio or it is actually going to separate the molecules based on the masses charge if the molecules are been separated based on the charge by mass ratio which means the process is going to be sensitive to the electrostatic interactions which means the electrophoresis can be utilized to map the interactions where the electrostatic interactions is playing the major roles whether it is actually imparting the positive charges to the molecules or whether it is imparting to the negative charge to the molecules or whether the positive and negative charges are coming together and forming the complexes these kind of questions can be addressed because the electrophoresis actually uh, consider the charge by mass ratio as one of the criteria to separate the molecule so you can imagine that a molecule is uncharged but if you do uh, some activity or some process and because of that the, if the molecule is acquiring the positive or the negative charges then this particularly positively charged molecules can be separated from the neutral molecules or vice versa that you have a positively charged uh, molecules and it is actually changing into a negatively charged molecules which means if you have a a mixture for example if you are uh, adding a enzyme like protein kinase c or pkc then what will happen if you have a positively charged uh, molecules it will actually going to impart a negative charges so if you want to monitor the activity of a pkc what you can do is you can just simply take the complete sa mixture which actually going to contain the positively charged substrates the pkc and then you can add the atp which is actually going to be the phosphorylating agents and as a result it is go actually going to generate the negatively charged uh, substrate so as a result if you take this whole mixture and load it into the horizontal uh, page or the horizontal agarose gel the positive will go towards the negative electrodes and the negative will go towards the positive electrode and that's how you can be able to quantitatively say that out of 100 molecules how many molecules are negatively charged and how many molecules are positively charged similarly the electrophoresis is also going to be consider the mass which means it is also separates the molecule based on the mass where for example when you are adding the sds into the electrophoresis the charge is getting neutralized and then the molecules are only going to be separated based on the mass which means it actually going to tell you the change in the change in the mass or the change in the size of the molecule we have two examples where it is actually going to tell you the change in size for example if you have a single protein and if you do some activity and it's actually going to acquire additional proteins or you have a monomer which is actually turning into a dimer these kind of stuff can be understand or can be addressed simply by using the electrophoresis the alternate is 
where the, there will be no change in mass but actually it is going to change the electrophoretic mobility of that particular molecule because of change in the friction of that molecule is that if the molecule is also going to change its shape. For example, if you have a circular shape object and that actually get converted into a pentagonal uh, object, this the surface area of this molecule is going to be smaller compared to the surface area of this molecule or there will be a change in the surface area of these two molecules. And one of the classical example is that if you actually monitor the uh, protein unfolding. For example, if you start with a monomer, it is still be 40 kDa, the unfolded protein is also 40 kDa, but the size of the, uh, the folded protein is going to be smaller compared to the size of the folded pro uh, unfolded protein. So, that can be also be monitored with the help of the native page or the urea page. So, these are the two main aspects what can be what can be exploited when you are designing an experiment considering the electrophoresis into the picture. So, we will going to discuss different type of experiments where we are either going to exploit the charge by mass uh, as a criteria or some places we are also going to exploit the criteria of the mass. So, our research problem one is that where we have the going to the, the question is that the mycobacterium tuberculosis H37RV was treated with a drug and it causes the appearance of a new protein X inside the bacterial cell. Now, the PhD student wants to determine the molecular weight of the proteins from the mycobacterium tuberculosis H37RV, which means that you are doing a treatment to the cell and that actually is specifically producing the protein X. And what the student want to know is what is the molecular weight of this particular protein and how to do that? You can do that simply by the uh, designing a suitable experiments because here what you are going to do, you are actually wants to know the molecular weight of the protein and that is how you can be able to utilize the electrophoresis. Let us see how to do that. So, in the experimental design, what you are going to do is you can just take the MTB cells okay, and what you do is you first treat it with the drug and that and then after that you actually going to prepare the cell lysate and the cell lysate is actually containing the protein of your interest which is protein X in this case and then what you do is you resolve this into a SDS page because you want to know only the molecular weight, you do not want to know the native molecular weight or the. So, in that case what you do is you run the SDS page and in the SDS page you also should run the uh, molecular weight marker okay, on the side. So, that it actually going to help you to, uh, to know at what position you are going to get what molecular weight and then what you do is you do the analysis of the uh, gel gel picture with the help of the uh, some of the softwares. If you remember in the in the previous module, we have also discussed how to do the image analysis, how to determine the uh, the concentration of a particular enzyme, particular protein, and how to determine the molecular weight also. So now what you do is you analyze the gel picture. So these are the things what you have to do. First you have to prepare the cell lysate, then you have to prefer perform the SDS page and then once you are done with the SDS page then you can draw a calibration curve. The calibration curve is to see what is the uh, how the gel is actually resolving the different sizes of the molecular weight of proteins. And that actually calibration curve can be used to determine the molecular weight of the unknown protein. Determine the molecular weight of unknown Let us see how to do that. So, what we have done? The step 1, we have done the SDS space. So, what we have done? We have actually resolved 
the protein of your uh, interest which means you the protein which you are interested to uh, identify the molecular weight or you which, which you have identified and you want to know the molecular weight along with that we have also run the molecular weight marker so markers are the uh, the commercially available uh, uh, mixture of the proteins which actually have the different types of protein and for these all these proteins their molecular weight is already known. Now what you have to do is in step 2 you are going to do the calculation of the relative mobility. The relative mobility is being defined as the migration of the protein from the lane versus the migration of the tracking die. So what you can do is first you determine the position of the tracking die. So that is actually going to be the, the uh, distance d what you are going to put and then you can be able to determine the distances of each and every band of the molecular uh, of the markers and that is how you can have the relative mobility of each and every band. And when you are looking at a band actually you, you see that this band is actually a slightly thicker than what you expect. So in that case what you have to do is you have to just simply take the middle of the point and from here you have to calculate the distance. The alternate approach is that you can do a three measurements you can do the uh, one measurements from this point one you can do another measurement from this point and you can do the third measurement from the uh, center of the band and that is how you can actually get the d1 plus d2 plus d3 and divided by 3 and that actually is going to give you the average distance and average d and that average d can be used for each and every band and that actually is going to take care of the, uh, the uh, errors what you are going to have because if you take the lower point your RF value is going to be on a higher side. If you take the upper value, you are going RF value is going to be on a smaller side. So that is how it for getting a minimum error, what you can do is you can just take the uh, uh, both the values and then you can take an average of that and that is actually it is going to be the most appropriate way of doing it. So once you have done the, uh, the RF value for D1, D2, D3, D4 and D5, you are going to get the RF values of the individual proteins and then what you can do is in the step 3 you can actually be able to draw a calibration curve between the RF versus the log molecular weight. So utilizing this you can plot the log molecular weight on the y axis versus the relative mobility on the x axis of the standard. So what you are going to get you are going to get a negative curve and it is going to give you the equation which is actually going to follow the equation of y equal to mx plus c. So that using the linear regression equations you can be able to estimate the mass of the unknown protein. So for example if you have the equation of mx plus c where the x value is what you are actually required. So if you, if you know the y value you can be able to determine the x value because all others are constant and m also you can be able to calculate from this graph and as a result you will be able to determine the protein. The alternate approach is that you draw a perpendicular and that perpendicular wherever the perpendicular hits to this curve you can actually get the value of x and since this is a log you can do a anti log uh, of that value and that value of x is going to give you the molecular weight of the protein of your interest. So this is a simple method of determining the, uh, the, the molecular weight of the protein uh, utilizing the SDS page. Uh, what you can also combine along with this analysis is that because if you determine the molecular weight and you can be able to determine the subunit molecular weight but if you are interested and you want to ex want further want to explore uh, the uh, about the oligomeric status of this particular protein then what you can do is you can run the similar kind of proteins onto a uh, onto a native page and then you can be able to determine the oligomeric status uh, which we are going to discuss in the next slide so 
how to determine the oligomeric status of the protein the polymeric polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis can be used to determine the oligomeric status of the protein a protein sample can be run under the denaturating as well as in the native condition in the two separate gels the protein of unknown molecular uh, protein of the known molecular weight uh, runs on both the gel and then you are going to do a rf calculation for the standard protein as we just discussed a calibration curve can be drawn from the native as well as the denaturing gel and it is used to determine the molecular weight of that particular protein under the native condition as well as the denaturating conditions. The oligomeric status of the protein is calculated from the formula. Oligomeric status is equivalent to the molecular weight of the protein what you are going to get from the native page divided by the oligomeric status what you are going to get from the SDS page. So, the process remains the same except that you might have to run the same sample on the two gels. One is native gel where you are not going to add the SDS or the beta mercaptoethanol and then you are also going to run an additional gels where you are going to run the protein under the denaturating conditions. Now, you have to run the markers as well. So, marker proteins are also very different when you run it for the native page versus the SDS page. So, the marker protein what I have shown you just now is only for the SDS page. So, then what you do exactly the same you are going to calculate the RF values of the standard protein you are going to draw the calibration of the standard protein in both as well as in both the conditions the native page as well as the SDS page and then you are going to determine the molecular weight of this particular protein under the native condition as well as the denaturating conditions and then what you are going to do is you are going to calculate the oligomeric status simply by dividing the molecular weight what you are going to get from the native conditions versus the SDS. The only thing what you have to worry is or what you do not have to much worry about is that imagine that you got the native molecular weight as uh, 46. Okay, and then you got a uh, SDS molecular weight as uh, 25. Okay, now if I have to calculate the oligomeric status, what I'll do is I will just divide the 46 divided by 25, which is actually going to be lesser than the 2. This is actually going to be lesser than 2 because ideally it should be 50 or this should could have been 23, but as you know that the oligomeric status is a perfect number it cannot be 1.75 or uh, 2.25 or any other number it can be either 1 it can be 2 it can be 3 it can be 4 it cannot be a middle number that is why whatever the number you get you have to make it to the uh, next round figure for example if you are getting a 1.75 you can make it 2 if you are getting the 1.2 then you again make it 1. So, that is how that is the general understanding that you have to adopt if you want to determine the oligomeric status in a more and more perfect uh, way of doing it. Because the oligomeric status cannot be a partial number, it can be a whole number. Now, let us move on to the next problem. So, the next problem is the research problem which we have discussed uh, before also and where if you remember when we were discussing about the gel filtration chromatography we have taken the same problem and now we, what I am going to do is I am going to take the same problem but instead of using the gel filtration chromatography now I am going to use the, uh, the electrophoresis. The protein X is present in three oligomeric status monomer, dimer and tetramer. Now scientists want to study the stability of the protein. So, you know that the native protein is partially folded, it actually forms a compact structures. When you expose them to the denaturating agents, it actually initially get the partially unfolded protein. When you increase the denaturating condition further, then it reduces the, it becomes, the structure becomes slightly more loose and at the end of the very high concentration of the denaturating agents, the protein get completely unfolded and this actually forms the extended conformations. Uh, which means the surf the the radius of the this particular structure is going to be very large compared to the native proteins. So now uh, how to solve this? You can run a urea page to address or to study these 
complexes and you study this particular uh, protein unfolding process. So, in a typical unfolding experiment, the protein is exposed to the different concentration of urea and then the structural changes in the protein can be monitored by the spectroscopic or the chain filtration technique. Unfolding of the protein causes an increase in the hydrodynamic volume of the protein and it results in the slower mobility in polyacrylamide gels. Why it is so? Because once the hydrodynamic volume will increase, it is actually going to experience the larger and larger friction. So, that is how the friction component is going to be increased and that is how its, its mobility is going to be compromised and that is why it is going to run at a slower rate. In the urea page, a polyacrylamide gel is prepared with the horizontal gradient of urea which is 0 to 8 molar. The same protein sample is loaded in the different lane and it is allowed to run vertically perpendicular to the urea gradient which means you are going to maintain a urea gradient uh, across the vertically okay, horizontal gradient uh, from this side to this side. So, this side you are going to have a 0 and this side you are going to have 8 molar urea and then you are going to resolve the protein samples in each lane corresponding to each urea concentrations. Uh, as, as sample runs in different lanes, it get exposed to the different concentration of the urea and consequently at a particular urea concentration, the protein is unfolded with the increase in hydrodynamic volume. So, what will happen is when you are starting the experiments, all the sample will look same except that they are going to get the exposure of the different amount of urea. So, what will happen? The unfolded sample the unfolded protein sample will migrate slower due to the increase in frictional forces and it gives a unique protein band pattern to provide qualitative or semi quantitative information about the protein folding intermediate. So, what will happen is when the proteins are being loaded into these wells and you are allowed them to migrate while they are running they are actually getting exposed to the different concentration of urea. So, you can imagine that up to the 4 molar urea, the protein is still maintaining a native uh, structure. So, that is why its uh, migration is very fast, but as the protein is moving towards the 5, 6 and all that high concentration of the urea, the protein is getting started unfolding and at this stage the protein got completely unfolded because as it, uh, it will unfold, it is actually going to experience high concentration of the frictional forces and because of that it is actually going to oppose the migration within the uh, acrylamide gels and as a result it will its, its migration is going to be slower and slower and slower and that slowing is actually going to be proportional to the increase in the hydrodynamic volume and that actually is can be mapped to draw the semi quantitative as well as the qualitative information when the protein is going to be unfolded, when the protein is going to be denatured and when its protein is stable. So, that information can be used to calc to, to, uh, to determine the relative stability of the two, two proteins or even the different components of a protein because if the different component of a protein have a different stability, what you will see is that it gets unfolded then it remains you know then it opposes the res then it it opposes the resistance towards the denaturating agents and then ultimately again it get unfolded so that's how you are may get a biphasic behavior where it is actually going to be unfolded it is like this right it is actually going to be remain native then unfolded then it going to be remain like this then it unfolded so it actually can give the multiple steps in the folding and that actually will say that the protein has the multiple regions which are actually going to be folded at a different kinetics and folding and their stability is also different for the denaturating agents. Uh, the information from the a gradient urea page needs further verifications from the other analytical techniques. In the addition to the protein folding, urea page can also be used to analyze the protein complexes as well as the covalently heterogeneity of the protein. So, 
the, every technique when you perform a technique it is not good enough or it is not uh, absolute on its own. So that is why the whatever the information you get from the urea page can be verified with the other analytical technique for example you can use the gel filtration techniques, you can use the cross linking experiments, you can do the CD based experiments and you can do some you know uh, fluorescence based experiments to even further verify that you have the multi step unfolding processes going on in this particular protein because you have the three or four different domains which are folding in a different way. So with this I would like to conclude our lecture here in the subsequent lecture we are going to take up few more exciting experiments where we are going to use the electrophoresis as a tool to answer those questions and to solve those questions and with this I would like to conclude our lecture here thank you.